Welcome to our worship service here at Lowellville Mennonite Church. I'm standing here at the entrance to the church where the greeter normally stands, waiting for people to come through the door. But unfortunately, no one will be doing that. At least I don't think so. This is actually the second take of this video I have done because on the last one when I said no one will be coming through the door, someone did, delivering something to the church. So here we are on July the 19th, 2020. This is the 19th online service that we have done. It's been four months since we have been meeting online only. And I'm sure that a number of you are asking, when are we going to be meeting in the church again? And all that I will answer about that is the church council and the pastoral team meets on Monday, July 27. Whatever we decide there will be announced on Sunday, August the 2nd. So we will be meeting online only at least through Sunday, August 2nd. I'll be talking about that a little bit more later on in the service as to what you might be able to expect. Our call to worship this morning is from Genesis chapter 28. This is one of the lectionary passages. It's about Jacob's ladder, which you'll be hearing more about later on in the service through some music. Verses 15 through 17, Jacob was fleeing from his brother Esau. We know how well they got along. And he had this dream. And in the dream, God says to him, know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back for this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. Jacob woke up and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he said, How awesome is this place. There, This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Wherever you're tuning in from this morning, may you know that God is in that place, and may he be with you. Love divine, all love's excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down. Fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies crown. Jesus, thou art all compassion, pure Associate Pastor Adam Hauser with our children's story for this morning. Oh, wait a minute. I better get this out of the way. Do you remember about four months ago, 
I was out in this same spot doing the children's story and it was when we were just getting some buds on the trees. I think it was March 29th, I think was the date. Well now these branches, I had to reach up to grab when I did that film and now look at them, they're hanging down. So all of those buds that we saw four months ago, and you've seen this too, I'm sure, all those buds that we saw those months ago now have opened up and have uh, become leaves or they've become flowers on some other things. We've gone through the blossom stage of some trees and plants where they flower before the leaves come out. And now we've got these big, full, leafy branches all around. And yes, I've mown the lawn and I have to duck down to get around these branches that hang so low. And earlier this spring, they were way up high above my head. Now that they're full of leaves, they're hanging down. And so that Sunday, back in March, we were walking around the yard and we were looking for signs of life. And so we were looking for the buds on the trees and things like that. And we were seeing little bits of signs of life. I don't know if you remember too, but uh, we looked at this flower bed, the flower bed that's behind me here. And there was just starting to be some little plants that we could see coming up. And I said they were tiger lilies. And I said, I'm hopeful that these tiger lilies that we transplanted last year will grow and that maybe we'll get some flowers. Well, we had the flowers. <laughs> They're not big and, and full and beautiful right now, but you can see where the flowers were on these tiger lilies. And maybe even uh, when we get another uh, sunny day, they might uh, open up there again. We'll have some, some fresh flowers on there. So we were looking for signs of life that day, and we were talking about the way that God is always making things new and where things seem to not be alive, that God makes them alive again, and he brings his new life into them. And so we looked for some of the ways to find that, and we were hopeful to see that, and now we are seeing it. And it's a good reminder again, a lot of times we talk about that in springtime, when we're starting to come out of winter and seeing the new life coming about. And uh, then we get into summer and we get caught up in everything being green and bright and all that life being around us. But maybe sometimes we forget to stop and, and think again about how God has given us that life. And so what we see now coming forth in the plants and in the trees and uh, the fruit of the flowers there uh, being um, the new life coming out of the flowers, that we see those things happening around us and we see the new life that Jesus gives us as well, that that can be a symbol of that for us. So I hope seeing that new life that we can maybe remember again, uh, that life that Jesus gives us. Now, if you remember just last week in Connie's children's story, she talked about uh, the parable of the sower. And do you remember how that started out with the sower sowing generously? And one of the ways that people sow seed, especially uh, years and years ago is they'd have a bag of their seed and they just spread it out. They just throw it out and it would grow uh, where they threw it. They didn't have the, the rows because they didn't have the same kind of equipment uh, to harvest it that we do now. So um, there is another parable uh, in the book of Matthew that again starts out with a sower, with a planter who plants very, very generously. And again, they they throw their seed out and they're planting. It's called the parable of the wheat and the weeds. And so they sow all of the wheat and then after a little while, those wheat starts to come up and they see the new growth there. But they also see some weeds starting to grow up in the same place as the wheat. So if you look behind me here, you can see where the flowers are and you can see where there also are some weeds, right? So they're growing up in the same place together here in the middle, I don't know if I'll be able to point to the exact spot, but here in the middle, uh, looks like that might be a blackberry plant that's growing in there. So this year there's no berries on it, but we'll have to see. Next year there might be some berries. So we'll see if that can take off in this little flower bed here that kind of gets forgotten about behind our fence. But anyway, we can see the things that we want to have planted in there, the tiger lilies, and then there's weeds too that are growing. So in this parable, Jesus talks about that uh, the sower, uh, the servants of the sower say, do you want us to pull out all the weeds so the wheat will grow better? And we'll only have wheat there. And the sower or the gardener says, no, uh, don't do that. Just let them grow together 
and when it comes time to harvest, then we'll separate out the wheat from the weeds. And so in this story, uh, it talks about, uh, in the story, the wheat are those that know the word of God, and those are the ones that follow God, and those are the ones that produce fruit for God, or, or grain in the case of the wheat. And the weeds are the things that come about in life that are not good, and the people that aren't good. And they live together. But at the end, they will be separated out, and those that have done good things for God uh, will be taken up with God. And those that have not done good things, they won't be with God. Now one of the things that I find really interesting about this parable is that I wonder in some ways if part of the reason why the weeds are left in there is because the weeds are given an opportunity as well to bear fruit. And so if we look at this little flower bed here behind us, uh, I mentioned the lilies that are there, and I mentioned the weeds that are growing up, some forms of clover and whatnot, and I mentioned what I think is a blackberry. I think it's a blackberry, not a raspberry, because we have some other blackberries around here. So that we didn't plant there. It just came up on its own. Um, we threw some compost in there that must have had some seed left in it. That's come up. Now if we had pulled that out right away, we maybe wouldn't have recognized that it actually was something that could produce good fruit. And we would have lost that. But we let it grow. Maybe by mistake, maybe not, I don't know. But we let it grow there. And now, like I say, it probably won't produce any fruit this year. But if we leave it in again, uh, maybe next year it will. Maybe it will produce fruit. And then what we'll have is not just the tiger lilies here that are producing something beautiful, but we also will have uh, the blackberries there that we can enjoy the fruit off of them as well. And so I think that's part of the reason in this parable why Jesus says that the wheat and the weeds will grow together is because one, there will be trouble, there will be hardship in the world, there will be people that aren't good that we encounter. Um, but also some of those people might have the opportunity to change and might have the opportunity to grow fruit again as Jesus produces that life and that fruit in those that follow him. Others also might see that and come to believe through us that are doing those good things. So I think there's a couple meanings that we can get out of that. But I wanted to come out and I wanted to see again uh, when I watched the video again from back in March, things still look pretty brown even though there were some signs of life coming. And now we do have the life opening forth all around us. So I hope that when we see those things around us that we can remember that Jesus brings new life and is continuing to grow. And even throughout the summer we have new things that will grow and new signs of life that we'll see around us. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for the life that you give. We thank you that you are with us and in us, always producing new things and always creating. May we take hold of your life. And may we come to know you more, to have a life that produces fruit and produces good things, even with the hardships around us, even if there's people that aren't so good around us. We thank you that you continue to produce good things in us and give us the hope that we all can produce good things in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. From the breaking of the dawn to the setting of the sun, I will stand on every promise of your word. Words of power strong to save that will never pass away. I will stand on every promise of your word. For your covenant is sure and on this I am secure. I can stand on every promise of your word. When I stumble and I sin, condemnation pressing in, I will stand on every promise of your word. You are faithful to forgive that in freedom I might live. 
so I stand on every promise of your word. Guilt to innocence restored, you remember sins no more, so I stand on every promise of your word. When I'm faced with anguish choice, I will listen for your voice, and I'll stand on every promise of your word. Through this dark and troubled land, you will guide me with your hand, and I stand on every promise of your word. And you promise to complete every work begun in me, so I'll stand on every promise of your word. Hope that lifts me from despair, love that casts out every fear, as I stand on every promise of your word. Not forsaken, not alone, for the Comforter has come, and I stand on every promise of your word. Grace sufficient, grace for me, grace for all who will believe. We will stand on every promise of your word. For our pastoral prayer time this morning, I'd like to reflect a little bit on the future of our congregation, what it's going to be like here perhaps in the next few weeks. I'm sitting in front of a puzzle that a lot of people have commented on when they visit our congregation. The puzzle is this picture right here, and it's in this frame here, which kind of has a light reflecting kind of different off of it. But some people will look at that and say, when are you going to finish that puzzle? What happened to all those other pieces? Well, we put this puzzle together and we passed out some pieces to members of the congregation and had them take that piece home. The idea being that even though the picture was not complete, even if someone is not here, they are very important to us and you are important to us. And I wonder if you could find your puzzle piece. Some of those people have moved away. Some of those people have passed away. I doubt this picture will ever be in the form it was when we first got it. But at the other hand, it is still complete in our hearts and minds as we think of you all. I'm reminded of a story this morning about a young man whose mother yelled up the stairs, son, it's time to go to church. And he shouted back down, I don't feel like going this morning. And she said, son, why not? He said, well, I don't really enjoy it. I don't think anybody likes me there. I don't think I have any friends there. Give me three good reasons why I should go to church this morning. And his mother said, son, number one, you don't really have to enjoy it to get something worthwhile out of the service. Two, you can't expect everyone just to be your friends or to like you. And three, you have to go. You're the pastor. Do you know why I thought of that story? We've had our grandchildren at our house every now and then as we uh, allow them to visit us to give our daughter and son-in-law a little bit of a break as they both work from home. And prior to those visits, visits, we are very careful to socially isolate and to protect ourselves so as not to put them at risk, and they do the same so as not to put us at risk. And I thought of that, if our church were to start to meet again, maybe in order to protect them, I wouldn't come. But then I got to thinking of that story. I have to. I'm the pastor, one of the pastors. My name is Keith Zare, by the way. I'm the senior pastor. I didn't announce that earlier. All the pastors would be here when we decide to meet again as a group. There are ways to do that safely. However, we are taking our cues from public health, and right now there's quite a bit of discomfort as to whether we should be meeting or not. The news from this past week was not all that good. Every week seems to bring something different. Last week it was very hot and dry outside. This week we had some blessed relief and some beautiful rain. But the news on the virus front seemed to get a little worse as the week went along. We are still under guidelines where only 33% of our capacity is recommended to be in the building, and even outdoors, groups of larger than 50 are strongly discouraged. We are choosing to go by the public health guidelines. Not everyone is doing that. There's a lot of 
misinformation going on out there, but we are choosing to abide by what the medical professionals are telling us. We have some people in our congregation that are a part of public health, and the person that we're in contact with here at Lowellville Mennonite is actually one of the higher ranking members of public health, not a member of our church, but someone who's been very helpful in telling us what to expect. So I don't know how long it's gonna be until we meet again in person. I have a hypothetical question for you. What if it's another four months? What will we do then? There are some churches that will be waiting that long. I learned of another church that has announced they are not gonna meet again until September of 2021. Now, why do that? Why would you say that? Well, this church said this gives us a chance to decide how we're gonna to respond to this without the pressure of knowing when we're gonna meet again and how to enhance our church in the absence of meeting together. Let's think about that for a little bit. A number of you have had to cancel your vacations. We have also, and that uh, is a sad thing, but at the same time, we need to explore the opportunities and the possibilities of what else we could do. Maybe a staycation at home instead of a vacation. And that's the way I'd like to think about the next several weeks or however long they may be. What are the possibilities and the opportunities for us as a congregation? We have already been encouraging alternative activities. I am making this video prior to our chicken barbecue picnic. Maybe I'll have some pictures to show you of that later. We also are planning another drive through ice cream uh, gathering on uh, Sunday, August 2nd. That's been an announcement from the fellowship committee. We're also encouraging small groups, somewhere between five to 10 people. If you'd like to get together to use the church, you're welcome to do that. Even if someone should get sick, because it's a smaller group that would mitigate the spread of whatever might happen. Now that's still kind of a horrible thought, that everybody in the group might get sick, but smaller groups will contain it a little bit more. And so we ask you to consider if you haven't seen anyone for a while and would like to, and would like to be a part of a small group if you're not a part already, let us know. Sewing Circle has been meeting. Other small groups have been meeting. There's talk of a Zoom Sunday school class. There's lots of things that we could probably do. One additional thing we could do is work a little bit more on our online services. We have had viewers from Florida, Virginia, California, Canada, and England, and other places as well tune in. Some of you have even written us letters of encouragement, and I will tell you right now, you don't have any idea how encouraging that is. We're simply talking to a camera on these services, but to hear you say that you are watching and that you are participating in our services. So, when it comes to membership in our church and having these puzzle pieces, wherever you are tuning in from, I now proclaim you as members of our online church at Lowellville Mennonite Church. It's important that we see each other. It's been great to have the special music that's been provided by other people in the church. Sometimes we can see them, sometimes we can't. If you're a part of our church and you would like to send some kind of greeting or send some kind of word of encouragement via video for everyone else to see or maybe just take a picture of your family so we can remember what you look like. Keep in mind that this will go on the internet available on YouTube and anybody can tune into it, be sensitive to that. But you are welcome to do that. We would love to see you and if you're one of our online members and I just proclaimed you a member a couple minutes ago, you too are encouraged to give us a greeting. We'd like to hear from you. We'd like to see you. We'd like to know where you are. There's a lot more that we can do. I don't know what the future holds, but I hope that we can look at the future and see the opportunities and the possibilities. Lord, you are faithful. You have watched over human beings since the creation of the world. Four months is rather insignificant compared to 40 years and yet you delivered the people that had been in exile for 40 years. Help us to remember, Lord, and help us to look for the opportunities and the possibilities. I'll close our pastoral prayer time with a reading from page 804 in our hymnal. Lord of all creation, provider of every good thing, you reveal yourself to us as creator and sustainer of the world. You offer us the earth, for our pleasure and care. And we offer now our label to you, our labor to you, to sustain the goodness of your creation. 
Help us use our ingenuity for the common good. Make us competent as we practice our skill. Grant us understanding and compassion. Give us open hearts and generous spirits. Grant us peace and purpose in living. Dear God, maker of heaven and earth, pour your creating power throughout all you do. Make us fruitful laborers in your vineyard through Jesus Christ. Amen. Nothing is lost on the breath of God. Nothing is lost forever. God's breath is love, and that love will remain, holding the world forever. No feather to light, no hair so fine, so flower to brief in its glory, no drop in the ocean, no dust in the air, but is counted and told in God's story. Nothing is lost to the eyes of God, nothing is lost forever. God sees with love, and that love will remain. journey too far, no distance too great, no valley of darkness too blinding, no creature too humble, no child too small, for God to be seeking and finding. Nothing is lost to the heart of God. Nothing is lost forever. God's heart is love, and that love will remain, holding the world forever. Impulse of love, no office of care, no moment of life in its fullness, no beginning to late, no ending to soon. But is gathered and known in its goodness. Hello, this is Connie Zair, pastor of Care and Nurture at Lowville Mennonite Church, and today is Keith's birthday. So I have decided, I'm going to see if I can find a record on here that, that um, might be good to play for his birthday.
will still love you even when you're 64. All of the records that he has collected, I was able to find one that he did not yet own and purchase it for him. So, happy birthday, dear. I hope you have a great day, and I still love you even though you're 64. And by the way, here is that ID bracelet that was around Keith's wrist in that cute baby picture. Before we were married in 1979, Keith was offered a job as a pastor at a small church in Grand Island, Nebraska. We were planning to work at Beaver Camp for the summer, and then we would let the congregation know of our plans during that time. While we were having lunch before the wedding, the women were in one room and the men in the other, just so we could have better conversation, I guess, his mother, Dolores Lehman Zare, asked me if we had made a decision about the pastorate. I told her we had not. You know, she said to me, there is something very special about Keith. Of course I knew there was something very special about Keith. That was why I was marrying him. And then she proceeded to tell me this story. The family was living in Harrisonburg, Virginia at the time, while Mike was attending Eastern Mennonite College. Keith was two years old. His mother had always told him to stay out of the parking lot, but this particular day, she was coming home from shopping, and he was excited to see her, so he ran out to greet her. And he was shorter than the car, so she didn't see him. And she ran over him. The tire went across the chest, right like that. He was taken to the hospital and had a collapsed lung and was not expected to live through the night. Dolores told of praying over and over that he would be okay. She did not want to lose him. Keith's dad later told us that the nurses turned most of their attention to Dolores, thinking Keith would die anyway, and she would need more help and support. Then, early that morning, she realized something was wrong with the way she was praying. She prayed, Yes, Lord, I want you to heal him, but the most important thing is that he live for you. If that is not to be, take him now. And she prayed instead that Keith would live for the Lord and that he would be used to share God's story with others. Later that day, his tongue inflated and it was fine. He was fine. Well, except for this little knot he has right there on his chest, but never mind. She was expected, she always expected at some point that Keith would be a pastor, whether it would be in Grand Island at that time or not. Five months later, she passed away from breast cancer. I'm so glad that I got to hear the story from her before she died, and I believe that her prayer was answered and Keith has been used to share God's story. Now, when I tell the story, I always feel the need for some kind of a disclaimer. I struggle with the question of why bad things happen to people. I can't reconcile the contradiction of God answering Dolores' prayer and letting Keith live only to let her die prematurely 20, 20 years later. What's up with that? There were so many people praying for Dolores to be healed. And there are so many other children who die in car accidents. Some may say it was God's timing. And while there may be, may be some truth to that, it sure sounds hollow when you are experiencing a loss. Why do we lose parents? or children, or friends when we feel it is much too soon for them to be taken? Why are some people born into any number of difficult circumstances and live horrific lives while I am so blessed? I don't know why bad things happen to people, but I do know we live in a fallen world and sometimes stuff happens. There are the laws of nature that come into play. We are not puppets. Our choices and actions often play a part in what happens in our lives and we must deal with those consequences. But for every example of this, there is an example of someone for whom this is not true. Lung cancer has a consequence of many, is a consequence of many years of smoking, yet we know people who have never smoked a day in their life and have lung cancer, or smokers who live for years seemingly unaffected. And so we question. <clears throat> I once heard a college student say how nervous she was about her upcoming final boards. And someone responded, the Bible says that God will give you the desires of your heart, and this is what you want, so you should be fine. Is it unbelieving to say 
You have worked and studied hard, so you should be fine. I am not downplaying God's work in our lives by any means, but sometimes action is also required on our part. The Mennonite World Review that arrived just yesterday contains an article about Allison Alexander, author of the book Super Sick, Making Peace with Chronic Illness. Having a chronic illness challenged and deepened her faith. She says when you are in intense pain and you know God has the power to stop it but doesn't, it's difficult to wrap your mind around that. But by faith, she also knows that God is walking with her through this and cares for her. When I was young, there was a commercial on TV for Calgon bath oil beads. It showed a woman being bombarded by oh so many requests. Children were screaming at her for attention. The telephone rang. Someone was at the door. A pot boiled over on the stove and on and on. She throws up her hands in the air and says, Calgon, take me away. And then she is transported to a quiet, relaxing bath without a care in the world, thanks to Calgon. I wondered then if God ever feels like that. He hears someone who prays for a weekend of beautiful weather for their wedding. The farmer next door is praying for a weekend of rain for crops that are parched. Or it's Super Bowl Sunday and the fans of Kansas City and San Francisco are both fervently praying for a win. A few days ago, I got a call from a friend who needed to vent. She was having ongoing issues with a co-worker and several things had happened that morning to cause her anger and frustration. She asked for prayer to deal with her anger, and then we chatted for a bit. When I hung up, I said a quick prayer, because after all, I said I would, and then I went about my day, but it seemed all day long I could not get settled into what I was doing for some reason. I have a Pray As You Go app on my iPad that has short meditations for each day, so at about 3 o'clock, I decided to listen to it in hopes that I could get myself centered a bit. The reading was on anger. I thought, hmm, that's interesting. She just talked about anger this morning, and now ways to deal with anger are being addressed. I again said a quick prayer for her and went about my afternoon. About an hour and a half later, I got a text from her thanking me for listening to her earlier and saying that she was able to have a conversation with that co-worker just then without biting off the co-worker's head. I told her about my reading and prayer and asked, just out of curiosity, when it happened. Her reply was, I had planned all day to talk with her tomorrow, but then out of the blue, about just an hour and a half ago, I realized my anger was gone and I could have a conversation with her. I remember feeling startled. I texted, I texted the coworker around 3.30 to see if she could talk, and then we talked for a while. I got goosebumps as I read her reply. Of course, God is all-powerful and can handle all of our requests without a Calgon bath. But we sometimes get hung up on the right way to pray. We feel that we are not using the right words, or that our words are going nowhere, or that our concerns are either too small for God to worry about or too big for God to handle. We worry that we don't pray often enough or our prayer time isn't long enough. I believe there is power in prayer, but the power comes from the one who hears the prayer, not the words being said. Jesus teaches us how to pray in the Lord's Prayer, but we have also been led to believe that there's some sort of blueprint for the right way to pray. Maybe we should rethink some of what we have been told about this more formal prayer time. You know, we can do it anywhere and at any time. Like Keith's mother Maybe we should think about what it is we are really asking. Is our prayer self-serving only for ourselves? Who do we want to benefit from our prayers? Could I make more of an effort to say just a sentence or two for someone who comes to my mind at any time during the day? For every request I make, could I offer a prayer of thanksgiving? For every prayer I offer, could I give equal time to listen for what God is saying to me? <clears throat> Excuse me. I've titled this sermon, The Inescapable, Inescapable God, because that is what the heading is for, the lectionary passage from Psalm 139, 1 to 12. 
O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high I cannot contain it, attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I might make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light all around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. And so in the end, can it be enough that, that God wants to spend time with us, that he cares for us, that he knows us, and that he wants to hear from us? Blessings to you as you go about your week. And now, if you will excuse me, I must bake a birthday raspberry pie. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Seems to veil his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His covenant and blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, He then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. shall come with trumpet sound, oh may I then in him be found, clad in his righteousness alone, fall blessed to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Thank you for joining us for this online service this morning. Just prior to the benediction, please know that the pastoral team, myself as the senior pastor, Connie Zayer as pastor of care and nurture, Adam Hauser as associate pastor, we are available to meet with you if you would like. That's one thing we can still do during this time. Our front porch has been used. I've used Maple Ridge. The church has been used, and we could use your house even if you have a comfortable place to meet there that would be safe for all of us to talk. We are available, and we ask you to contact us if we have not contacted you and you are looking to meet with us or to pray with us for any reason. Our benediction this morning is from page 682 of our hymnal. May the ground below, the air above, and the sea around be hallowed and filled with the God of life, the Christ of love, and the spirit of peace. And may we all cry glory before the God of life, the Christ of love, and the spirit of peace. Go in peace, everyone.